This meeting is being recorded. Okay, with it being 3 p.m., I would like to call to order the February meeting of the Marathon County Environmental Resources Committee. And so the first item on the agenda is public comment. I understand that we do have some individuals who have signed in but uh, have not expressed a specific intent to speak. Now would be that opportunity. If you would like to speak to one of the items on the agenda, uh, please raise your hand if you are here in the room. I see no hands being raised. If there, is there anyone who called in that we have uh, listed for public comment? Hearing none, I will call one more time. If there is anyone looking to make a public comment, please indicate that at this time. All right, seeing and hearing none, we will move forward. Item three on the agenda is the approval of the January 4th, 2022 ERC committee min meeting minutes. We have a motion to approve by Supervisor Drabeck and a second by Supervisor Oberbeck. Are there any comments or corrections to the minutes as presented in the packet? One more call for comments or corrections to the minutes as presented. Hearing and seeing nothing, all in favor of approving the minutes uh, for the January 4th meeting as presented, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. We will move forward on to item four, operational functions required by statute, ordinance, or resolution. Item 4A is the public hearings, review, and possible actions and recommendations to county board. So at this time, we will transition into the three public hearings that we have listed for today. Uh, we do ask everyone to mute your electronic devices. And we will take each of these items in the order that they are posted on the agenda. So the Marathon County Environmental Resources Committee is now meeting in public hearing on the location, plans, specifications, and purpose of the following projects. Item one, Jason Flieger on behalf of Jonathan Shanick, rural estate to heavy industrial in the town of Hewitt. Item two, public hearing on the text amendment changes to the general code of ordinance chapter 17 zoning code. And item three will be a public hearing on the town of McMillan recommended changes to the town zoning district map. In order to start the public hearing, I would first like to introduce the members of the committee. I am, my name is Sarah Guild and I am the vice chair of this committee. Our chair is unfortunately unable to attend today. Uh, we also have supervisors Bill Conway, Rick Seafelt, Alan Drabeck, Randy Fifrick, Dave Oberbeck, as well as Marilyn Bend from the Wisconsin Towns and Villages Association, and our newest representative, Rodney Roscoff, with our F farm services. So welcome to the group, Rodney. We also have a number of staff that are present. Uh, I believe we have Lori Miskimmons. She is our director. Paul Daigle is our county conservationist. Uh, Robert Hoffman is our land use technician. Cindy Crager is our administrative coordinator, along with Nicole Delaney, uh, also an administrative coordinator, and Andrew Lynch, our transportation planner. Are there other members of staff present? I believe that's a, oh, oh. Uh, this is we have Dave Hagenbusher with Solid Waste Department. Thank you, Dave. All right, so now we will read information about the purposes of the uh, public hearing. The establishment of the ERC committee is required by law for purposes of administration of county ordinances and land conservation programs. This committee must follow state laws and local ordinances as written. 
This committee cannot change or ignore any part of the ordinances or state laws, but must apply the laws as written. The purpose of this committee is to hear and decide on proposed ordinances and ordinance revisions, rezoning petitions, and provide direction on land conservation and planning programs. The ERC committee will give a full and fair hearing to any person applying for a rezone petition. A taped recording is being made of the meeting, which will assist with preparation of written hearing minutes. The committee is interested in hearing all pertinent comments and questions. Each hearing will be opened by reading the public notice and allowing staff to present a staff report, including evidence from any on-site inspection. The applicant and anyone wishing to testify will be sworn in and allowed to give testimony. Witnesses will be called in the order of those first in favor, second in opposition, and then third as interested may appear. The committee may ask questions of the zoning staff and applicant. It is necessary that we set a reasonable time limit on individual statements and the overall length of the hearing. To promote orderly discussion, anyone wishing to present oral testimony or ask questions relating to the hearing should state your name and present your testimony or questions so it becomes part of the official record. We do request that you avoid repetition, so if someone has already made comments similar to what you are going to state, you may swear in and simply say that you agree with the prior speaker. Once the committee has all the necessary facts, the chairman will close the hearing, allowing no further testimony, and the committee will deliberate and decide in front of the public whether the applicant has met the standards in the ordinance. No additional testimony from the public is allowed during the deliberation. However, the committee may ask a question to staff for purposes of clarification. After a decision is made, the committee will proceed to the next hearing. Many of the decisions made by the committee are a recommendation to the Marathon County Board of Supervisors. They will take up the matter at a future county board meeting. Please contact staff for more information regarding the county board process. And with that, the committee will now hear the application of 4A item one, Jason Flieger on behalf of Jonathan Shannick for rural estate to heavy industrial in the town of Hewitt. And to begin, we will swear in our CPZ staff representative. And Robert, please state your name for the record. Robert Hoffman. And do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Wonderful. You may proceed. All right. Thank you. I'd like to present to you item number 4A1, the petition to rezone land for Jonathan H. Shanak for today, February 1st, 2022. Um, moving down to public hearings and meetings, the Town of Hewitt Town Board meeting met on December 13th of 2022, and today the Marathon County Environmental Resources Committee is meeting to, to discuss this matter. The petitioner in this case is Jason J. Flieger, and the property owner in this case is Jonathan H. Shanak. The location of the rezone request um, is shown below. The area proposed to be rezoned is located approximately 0.63 miles south of the intersection of Trap Road and Sunrise Road in the town of Hewitt as shown below in the red arrow. The nature of the request, the nature of request relates to the petition of Jason J. Flieger on behalf of Jonathan H. Shanak to amend the Marathon County Zoning Ordinance to rezone lands from rural estate to heavy industrial, described as below and located at, at 243176 Sunrise Road in the town of Hewitt. Moving on to the existing zoning district at hand, it is the rural estate zoning district, and the proposed zoning district is the heavy industrial zoning district. Below is a existing town zoning district map showing the adjacent parcels and their zoning districts. Um, as you can see in the map, the adjacent parcels are zoned rural estate in orange and heavy industrial in pink with other industrially and agriculturally zoned parcels within close proximity. Here is just a, a red arrow pointing to the approximate area proposed to be rezoned, shown in a red dotted outline, and there are those adjacent zoning district colors once again here shown. There was a legal notification posted in the Wausau Dairy Herald. The existing generalized land use land cover map for the town of Hewitt shows the area proposed to be rezoned as commercial services, woodlands, and vacant barren land uses in the town's comprehensive existing land use land cover map. The adjacent land uses are comprised of similar land uses. Below you can see um, the corresponding colors and the, once again the approximate area to be rezoned. 
Moving on to the town comprehensive plan future land use map, the area proposed to be rezoned is shown as commercial services, woodlands, and vacant barren land uses in the town's comprehensive plan future land use map. The adjacent land uses are also comprised of similar land uses. Moving on to the implications with the farmland preservation plan, the area in question was designated as a non-farmland preservation area in the farmland preservation plan. Yet, the town of Hewitt does not participate in farmland preservation zoning. Therefore, there are no parcels within the town of um, Hewitt that are zoned as farmland preservation. Moving on to significant parcel limitations or natural features. As shown below, the area proposed to be rezoned contains no mapped wetlands, FEMA floodplain areas, or shoreland overlays or waterways. Moving on to the existing preliminary certified survey map that was submitted, here is um, the area to be rezoned once again with a red dotted outline. Moving on to aerial photograph number one, once again the proposed area to be rezoned in a red dotted outline. And a subsequent second aerial photograph showing more of a, a zoomed out um, depiction of the area to proposed to be rezoned again, shown in a red dotted outline. Moving on to the town's recommendation, on December 13th of 2022, the town of Hewitt's town board recommended approval to the Marathon County Environmental Resources Committee, as shown below. Moving on to the staff comments regarding the Environmental Resources Committee's conclusions of law. Number one, the rezoning is substantially consistent with the following plans. First, the Marathon County Comprehensive Plan. Second, the Town Comprehensive Plan. And third, the Marathon County Farmland Preservation Plan. The Marathon County Comprehensive Plan relies on the Town Comprehensive Plan regarding specific land uses and zoning districts for individual parcels. The area proposed to be rezoned is shown to be designated as commercial services, woodlands, and vacant barren land uses in the town's future land use map. Yet, conservation planning and zoning staff rely on the towns to make these recommendations given the town board members and residents know their town and the true purpose and intent of the plan. The area in question was not designated as farmland preservation. The town of Hewitt does not participate in farmland preservation zoning. And as indicated by the town resolution and recommendation, it appears the rezone is consistent with the purpose and intent of the comprehensive plan. Number two, the location of the proposed rezone, excuse me, proposed development minimizes the um, amount of agricultural land converted and will not substantially impair or limit current or future agricultural uses of other protected farmlands. Um, with this petition for zone change, it appears as though there will be no active cropland being converted as a result of the proposed rezone. Moving on to number three, the applicant has demonstrated that first, there is a need for the proposed development, and that need is related um, directly to, not necessarily a development, but a adjustment of a property line that is running through an existing building that is zoned as heavy industrial. Number um, two, um, adequate public facilities are present or will be provided. All necessary public facilities are anticipated to be provided, if not already provided, given any proposed development would re rely on pri private systems, such as a private well and sanitary system, if applicable. Providing public facilities will not be an unreasonable burden to the local government. There will be no anticipated burden on local government. All applicable building, construction, and use standards will be applied during the zoning and building permit review process. Once again, with this proposed petition for zone change, there is no development um, being actively proposed. Number four, the rezoning will not cause unreasonable air and water pollution, soil erosion, or adverse impacts or effects on rare or irreplaceable natural areas. All federal, state, local, and um, Permitting and approvals are required for any applicable development on this site. Additionally, the proposed rezone will likely not result in any unreasonable air or water pollution as there is no new development proposed. Any earth disturbance greater than one acre would also need to obtain a DNR stormwater management permit. Number five, the town has approved the proposed rezone of the property. The town of Hewitt Town Board has recommended approval of this rezone petition. And number six, um, all concerns from other agencies on the proposed rezone have been addressed. Um, there was one concern brought to the attention of our department. The county was made aware of a concern by James M. Griesbach of the Marathon County Highway Department regarding the seasonal weight limits on a county road, specifically County Road J, which is one mile west of the location of the proposed rezone. James informed Conservation and Planning and Zoning that the seasonal weight limit begins one half mile north of State Highway 52 and that the approval of the proposed rezone would not change the seasonal posting, which states that no oversized loads are permitted during the seasonal weight limit period. On January 18th, 2022, Robert Hoffman called James via telephone and explained to him the need for the proposed rezone and thanked James for making conservation planning and zoning aware of the county highway department's concerns. Moving on to staff recommendations, the rezone meets all the, the um, zoning district standards as it relates to size, 
frontage, access, and dimension. If approved, the town of Hewitt, sh town of Hewitt excuse me, should update their comprehensive plan to reflect the proposed rezone. The future and existing land use um, maps should also reflect the rezone in question. The rezone also appears to be consistent with the purpose and intent of the town's comprehensive plan, as indicated by the town resolution. Based on the information provided above, findings of fact, conclusions of law, and the town's recommendation, it appears the rezone request meets all rezone criteria and standards for rezoning. Therefore, conservation planning and zoning staff recommend that the Environmental Resources Committee recommend approval to the Marathon County Board of Supervisors. That completes this presentation. Thank you. I would now like to open it up to any questions. Thank you. Is there any questions from committee members uh, on the staff report? Any questions for staff at this time? All right, hearing none, I will then move into the public hearing portion. Uh, so is there any members of the public present who would like to speak in favor of this request? Anyone looking to speak in favor? If you are in the room, please raise your hand. If you are on uh, joining us remotely, please just speak up. I will call one last time. Is there anyone looking to speak in favor of the request uh, for the rezone in the town of Hewitt? All right, hearing and seeing none, I will move on to anyone looking to speak in opposition to the request. Again, is there anyone looking to speak in opposition to this rezone request? I'll ask one more time. Anyone looking to speak in opposition to the rezone in the uh, town of Hewitt? Okay, hearing and seeing none, we'll move on to, is there anyone looking to speak as interested may appear for general comments on this uh, rezone proposal? Again, anyone looking to make general comments as interest may appear? And one more call. Is there anyone looking to speak uh, as interest may appear on the rezone in the town of Hewitt? All right, and one final call. Is there anyone who would like to speak as part of the public hearing for the town of Hewitt rezone request? Okay. If no one wishes to testify for this application, then I am now declaring the public hearing on Jason Flieger on behalf of Jonathan Shenack, a rural estate to heavy industrial in the town of Hewitt, to be closed. The committee will now deliberate on the application and apply the standards of the zoning ordinance. Committee members, what is your wish or questions on this item? Madam Vice Chair, this is Supervisor Feifrick. Supervisor Feifrick is recognized. I would make a motion that we recommend approval of the rezone request of Jason Flieger on behalf of Jonathan Shanock of uh, rezoning the property from rural estate to heavy industrial in the town of Hewitt and accept the findings of facts as presented by staff. Thank you. We have a motion. Is there a second? We have a second from Supervisor Drabeck. Uh, any comments or questions regarding the motion on the floor? One last call for comments on the motion. All right, hearing and seeing nothing. All in favor of approval of the motion to approve the uh, Town of Hewitt rezone request and recommend or recommend approval to the full Marathon County Board of Supervisors, please signify by saying aye. Aye. And any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. We will now move on to the next item under public hearings, item 4A2, the public hearing on the text amendment changes to the General Code of Ordinance, Chapter 17, Zoning Code. Uh, and Robert, will you be doing this as staff as well? I will not, Lori Miskimmons will. Okay. Once we get through the technical uh, difficulty on, on this side, we'll go. Okay. All right. I think you need to swear me out. <laughs> okay. okay, then could I get your name uh, and title for the record? Lori Miskimmons, Conservation Planning and Zoning Director. And do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. You may proceed with your report. Okay. I will just give an overview of 
the text amendments, we brought these before you last month. There are 17 amendments being considered for our Chapter 17 Zoning uh, General Code of Ordinances. And we uh, sent this information out to the towns in December 17th and January 11th, giving them information on the summary of the amendments and where to locate the draft document on our website or request a copy so that they could review and submit comments on the amendments we're proposing. We did also hold an open house on January 18th at the CPZ at 2, 212 River Drive and did not receive um, any attendees, but we did receive three uh, bits or comments or input throughout this process, which I will share with you. The first comment we did receive was in regards to the number 17 amendment on the list in terms of the definitions of structure minor. It was just um, a typo that somebody wanted to correct in terms of the summary table says includes decks of less than 100 square feet. That should say decks of 100 square feet or less. The way the definition is proposed for rewriting it is up to 100 square feet, anything over that would no longer, or is not a minor structure, but in anything 100 square feet or less is within the minor structure definition. The other comments we received were on amendment number four in regards to the shipping and storage containers. So we received a comment from a, the town chair of Elderon that they were not in favor of the proposed changes that we are putting forth in these amendments. And then the town of Plover has also stated they are in favor of the changes to the, the shipping containers and storage units. So this is referring to in the table three of uh, permitted uses, if you look at the permanent use of storage and shipping containers, as our code is written now, in the rural estate districts and larger, those, those structures are permitted under a conditional use permit process. The change that is being proposed or it's put out for comment would be to permit them in the rural estate districts and all the larger districts and require a conditional use permit in the smaller residential districts. And I believe, Robert, do you have that table pulled up? Table three. Just so that they can see the difference there. about page 22 or so. <laughs> so while he's pulling it up, I just wanna point out again, we received um, two differing comments on this amendment. One was from the town chair of Elderon saying that they did not um, support the changes we were proposing. The other was from the town of Plover saying that they did, um, they, they do support these changes. They had intended to bring their own petition before the ERC late last year, but decided they would wait and see what the ERC did via our annual amendments before they decided on how they wanted to proceed. And the change, again, the change that is being proposed is that in the larger districts, uh, rural estate and larger, it would go from conditional use permit to permitted use, and then we would add conditional use permit options for the smaller districts. Otherwise, we received no other comments on the amendments put forth. As we explained last month, most of these are small text amendments to clear up, um, make something more consistent or provide clarity when we are implementing the code or update something as it relates to a federal standard. Um, but we can take any other questions and then I don't know if anyone else is here today to comment on it, so. All right, thank you. Are there questions from uh, the committee for staff? Is there Maryland? a reason why they declined, didn't want the recommendation to one town? What was their reasoning? They don't want them in any of their districts in the town would be their, their preference, so. But they didn't say why? No. All right, any other questions from committee members? Okay, hearing. This is Supervisor Pfeiffer. Supervisor Pfeiffer is recognized. 
Now, is there any limits on with this going as a permitted use with these type of structures on the amount of them that somebody could have on the property? Is there any screening requirements that would be in place? Robert, do you want to take that one? Sure. Thank you, Randy. Um, currently, the ordinance with this proposed change or this proposed revision would not include, um, per se, a limit on, on the number that, that is allowed or are allowed. Um, so that would answer your first part of your question. And the second part of your question, um, if there is a conditional use permit um, applied for for one of these storage and shipping containers in one of our residential districts, these smaller districts, um, the Marathon County Board of Adjustment does have the ability to actually place conditions on that permit to require certain screening and buffering activities. So it's almost customizable on a case-by-case -case basis, Randy, to answer your question. Um, but, but for those larger districts, for those um, agricultural districts, anything greater than rural estate, um, there would be no um, ability for our department to really place um, further conditions for, for screening and buffering. Thanks, if I could just uh, follow up comment. Go ahead. I can see the, I can see both sides of the argument here and that I have seen a number of these type of storage and shipping containers within um, a lot of different rural areas. Um, I guess the bigger question is, I think maybe maybe would it solve some of the concerns from the folks that are against having these if we had some type of limitation on the number and the amount of space that they can take up, something like that. Um, I understand that's one more thing that we have to now keep track of, but that might just be some way of limiting the concerns out there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, would staff like to respond to that? Um, I don't know if we've ever had that discussion internally, so I'll, I'll let Robert weigh in if that's ever been considered. So, yeah, um, thank you, Randy. Yeah, we haven't really discussed that as a as a department, but I think that's a great idea in terms of um, reducing the effect of having um, a property just become coated with storage or shipping containers. Um, but as we have, as we've been seeing, you know, with the uh, with the pandemic, with the economic situation. These are becoming a, a very economic, economical sort of option for, for property owners to pursue if they want a, a method of being able to store materials out of the elements, so on and so forth. Um, but I hope that sort of answers um, the question. Thank you. Thank you. Another question, uh, Supervisor Seafelt. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> You're on. No? Okay, yep. thank you, Chair. Uh, Vice Chair Gill. Uh, Marilyn brought up the question why Town Elder did not want them. Part of it is the graffiti that's on the side of these. Um, I don't think they would have a problem if they would clean up the containers as far as what the wording's on the side of them. Uh, basically, that's Town Elder's problem. Uh, it, some of these look pretty tough. You know, and you, you, we have the ordinance not to have only for what, 90 days, I think now, if I'm not mistaken, uh, or for agricultural use. The one that in the town elder is agricultural use, these are brand new containers. They're painted well and nobody really has a problem. The problem is the ones with with the wording on the side of the containers. So that's, I think that's why Town Elder does not want them in there. Thank you, Supervisor. Um, are there any other questions right now? And just as a reminder, we do still uh, have the, we're still in the public hearing, so I do still need to make sure we get public commentary after our, we're done with our comments before the committee transitions into de debating the item. But if you have additional questions for staff um, or things related to the questions, now would be the time. Supervisor Overbeck? There, within uh, 17.401, there is a, a paragraph B that talks about materials and appearance. It also talks about screening for storage and shipping containers. So I guess if that remains in place and, and still is there, I think also it should be that while they make statements about architectural or the accessory structures, I encourage to match the character and use 
to which they are an accessory. So I know in other uh, conditions like garages and whatever, and like in the city of Wausau, it's, it's, it should match the housing, uh, even in color. Uh, that they should be maintained without graffiti or some wording to that effect might be uh, worthy of putting in there since this is already in the, the ordinance. Thank you. So, staff, can you speak to if that is an area that's applicable to the uh, the item that we're, we're discussing right now or if that would be a change that would need to happen? Yes, absolutely. Um, so um, the previous gentleman who just spoke is absolutely correct. In 17.401.01 um, subsection B, there is a materials and appearance section that states to the extent possible, the exterior facade materials appearance and architectural design of all accessory structures are encouraged to match the character of the use to which they are accessory. And then furthermore, it states that storage and shipping containers used as permanent accessory structures may be required to be screened from roads and or adjacent properties in those districts which, we are, which they are allowed. Where applicable screening may be man-made and or vegetative and shall be approved by the zoning administrator prior to the issuance of a zoning permit. So there, there is the ability for our department to actually require screening. Um, I do apologize about misrepresenting that information given I have not yet permitted um, any of these yet. So I, I have not done that yet, so thank you. Great. Any other questions from committee members for staff as far as the uh, this proposal uh, goes? All right. Would you consider temporary time limit? That's 90 days. So 90 days is considered temporary? All right. Supervisor Seabelt? <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, okay, so it's 90 days. And it is in there that they are supposed to be cleaning, cleaning these containers up to match. Who is enforcing it? I, I think CPZ is enforcing it, but what, what is the condition? How much time? Because these been, containers have been sitting out in our area for seven months, and they got basically says China on the side. And people don't like the appear, uh, appearance. So who is enforcing this to clean them up? So the, the 90 days is for the temporary, just to be clear. Yeah. So. so am I correct in understanding that because these are all proposed changes that aren't in effect yet, they wouldn't fall under those ones that he mentioned that are sitting there wouldn't fall under that? So, OK. I, I don't know if I'm understanding the question, but so the, if they're temporary, we do, Robert, correct me if I'm wrong, but we do have a 90-day limitation, I believe, on the temporary. But this, this proposed change is related to permanent, just permanent placement. So just to be clear on that. Okay. I'm not sure if I'm answering the question. <laughs> that you're well, uh, since this is a specific thing, I just asked the supervisor. He'll follow up with you afterwards oh, okay. to okay. Uh, discuss what sounds like a currently it, unique situation, um, although we want to make sure that it can't be replicated. Uh, Paul, you had a Yeah, um, I got it to answer. Paul, uh, Paul okay. first public hearing, so I need your name and uh, for the record and title Paul for Paul Dagle, record. County Conservationist from Marathon County. I work at 210 River Drive, Wausau, Wisconsin. And do you swear to tell the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Go ahead, sir. To answer uh, Supervisor Seafelt's uh, question directly, um, when you look at the materials and appearance, there's words like encourage to match the character. When you have those words, that's all they are. You would have to change that to shall, mm -hmm. if that's enforceable. And um, just to give you background, Marathon County's really not got into uh, the, the look and feel and texture of buildings and appearance where uh, municipalities and their zoning codes tend to get much more detailed with that. We just simply don't have the staff to go out. Uh, we have a lot of complaints on sheds that aren't painted and things like that, and we just don't have the staff to respond to that. And I think the same would be true for these storage sheds. Okay. Thank you. Any additional questions from committee members for the staff report? Supervisor Overbeck. One of the things could be done um, would be before they are given a permit that that, such as the china or whatever on the side, has to be removed. That it has to be one color, or something that could be put in the code or the zoning code that states when you place these, these are the conditions. 
and it has to be, at that time, painted. Um, then it, it's just like any other structure. If it, it's not maintained, then it's an issue. But at least when it's placed, it is corrected, and you don't have advertisements or graffiti or whatever on it when it is put in place at that residence. Any, uh, any more questions? All right, hearing none at this time, I will move forward into the public comments for this hearing. Uh, is there anyone from the public looking to speak in favor of the request for the um, text amendment changes to Chapter 17 Zoning Code? I'll ask again, anyone looking to speak in favor as a member of the public for the proposed cha text amendment changes? One more time, anyone looking to speak in favor of the proposed changes? All right, hearing and seeing none, I will move on to, is there anyone looking to speak in opposition to the proposed text amendment changes for the General Code of Ordinances, Chapter 17? Again, anyone looking to speak in opposition to the proposal? One more time, anyone looking to speak in opposition to the proposed text amendment changes? All right, hearing none, we'll move on to, is there anyone who is looking to speak as interest may appear to the text amendment changes? Again, anyone who wishes to speak as interest may appear to these changes? One final call, is there anyone who would like to speak uh, as part of the public hearing for the uh, proposed text amendment changes to the General Code of Ordinance Chapter 17 Zoning Code? All right, if no one else wishes to testify for the application, I am now declaring the public hearing on the Chapter 17 Zoning Code text amendment changes to be closed. The committee will now deliberate on the application and apply the standards uh, as directed. So committee, uh, just for a point of clarification, um, for today, we're looking for this committee to make a possible recommendation to the county board. Is that correct, Lori? Correct. Okay, so um, committee members, and then just as another point of clarification, it is my understanding that um, none of these changes are currently in effect, which means we could not have been implementing any of these previously. Uh, but if we move this forward, it will just go to the county board for final consideration. It is just looking for us to make a recommendation that it does so with the current proposals. Um, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, and I, I believe you could also choose to postpone with some further direction and we could bring it back to you. <laughs> so, and that was going to be my next question is if this committee were to decide today that they would like to see some additional information added, does that, how does that impact any kind of a timeline that staff is working on as far as getting this through? I know sometimes we have an extra month cushion and other times we do not, especially with an uh, um, election on the horizon and things like that. I, we believe we have that extra month cushion that we could delay so a month. So. Okay. Well, then with that, any comments from committee members or supervisors? Supervisor Oberbeck? I, I would like to see um, an evaluation of, especially with, since some towns are concerned about the storage containers, that we do put in some requirements as far as what the appearance of those accessory structures are and some standards before they're placed on the site um, and that means moving the word or taking out the words are encouraged to match being that it shall match the character but then you have to define what that character is whether it's one paint color or whatever or a standard that takes off all graffiti and or markings from that container uh, so it's presentable to the community in which it's placed. So I, I think there's some evaluation because I know this is a concern in various areas of the county uh, as far as these containers and what they look like, whether they're rusted or deteriorating. 
that they should be kept up much like any other uh, building on the site. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think one thing that I would like to get, again, some clarification from staff on, my understanding is that the changes that are being proposed, uh, because on the larger properties, on the larger zoning districts, uh, these units would be permitted without approval from staff, correct? Is that what, in other words, if somebody were to be bringing one of these containers onto their property and they had a larger agricultural area where it was permitted, um, there wouldn't be any oversight from the county regarding the look of it as this is currently written. Is that accurate? That would be inaccurate. Um, our department, it would, the use of having that type of structure, um, if these proposed changes were to go through for the larger districts, the use would become permitted. So our department would still require a zoning permit to be issued in the event any type of structure is proposed that's greater than 100 square feet in size. Okay. Um, on average, all these containers are larger than that, so we would still require some sort of zoning permit um, prior to the placement of these types of structures on properties. Um, given the ease of how easy it is to transport these structures um, from one property to the next, um, our department does have a number of just outstanding violations where people just place them uh, on their properties. Um, but I hope that answers your question, Sarah. Mm -hmm. It does. Thank you for pointing out what I knew, and as I was saying it, I was remembering, so sorry about that. But okay, so it, it could be feasible that as part of the permitting process, there could be some kind of a, an addition on there. All right. Vice Chair Supervisor Pfeifferk. Supervisor Pfeifferk is recognized. Thank you. Um, as somebody that's done zoning enforcement in my profession, I, I really dislike seeing language where we're talking about to the extent possible and may, um, it makes it very hard on the enforcement side of that. And I think it's very difficult for these type of structures and saying, you know, having them match the principal structure, or whatever. I like the idea of stating that there need to, that they need to be one color or some way of just ensuring that they're very. It's very simple to enforce that we're requiring one color um, that makes it a lot easier than to the extent possible matching the character of the property. Um, I guess my other concern is just overall with allowing maximums on these and they can be a very efficient way and when done properly they can blend into an agricultural rural property with no problem look like they're part of it uh, part of the reasons why we have regulations in place is because people don't follow those simple common sense solutions and we end up regulating um, what end up becoming giant piles and stacked on top of one another so I think that that would, should be some consideration on maybe the maximum number of storage units or shipping containers that are allowed on the maximum property. But I think it's something that should be taken back uh, and presented to the, the ERC at a future meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other comments from committee members? All right, I'm not hearing any, but the sense that I'm getting is that the committee is uh, is looking at having some additional work done to put in some parameters um, on the number of shipping containers and the appearance of shipping containers before it feels comfortable moving this these text amendments forward to the county board. Um, I am assuming there needs to be a motion on that, but uh, Chair Gibbs, I would defer to you. I thought so. So uh, is there anyone who would like to make a motion to that effect? This is Supervisor Pfeifferk. Supervisor Pfeifferk is recognized. I'd make a motion that we recommend postponing any action on this and ask staff to take the discussion from today's meeting and present updated regulations in regards to storage and shipping containers at our March meeting. Okay, we have a motion. I believe a second from Supervisor Oberbeck. All right. Um, any additional comments, either from committee members and or staff? Is that motion clear enough for you to understand the uh, the direction? Yes. Okay. All right. One last call for additional comments on this item. Otherwise, all in favor of the motion to postpone uh, the to the text amendment change request until the March meeting in order to give staff time 
to add some additional uh, information related to the shipping containers, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed to the motion? Motion is carried. We will uh, bring this back at a future, ideally, March meeting. <coughs> All right, uh, then I will move on to item 4A3, the public hearing on the town of McMillan, recommended changes to the town zoning district map. And the staff report for this uh, will again be... Yes. Director? All right, so... Um this one before you today is a list of rezones from the town of McMillan. This is in conjunction with their comprehensive plan update. So they began uh, these updates in 2020 and 2021 to update their comprehensive plan. As part of that process, um, they were, as they were looking at their future land use, several landowners did um, approach the town about rezoning through the comprehensive plan update. And we were also contacted by DATCAP uh, during the process to let us know that several parcels within the town of McMillan had incorrectly been zoned, put in the Farmland Preservation District. We believe this was a clerical error that took place around 2016 or so. Um, so Robert, if you go to the table um, that is in the packet, you'll see that the, there's two two groups of parcels of lands that are being proposed through the rezones in McMillan's comprehensive plan update. The first, the top part of the list are landowners who approached the town of McMillan through the comprehensive plan update to request a rezone that was in line with that update. The second or the bottom part of the list was provided to us uh, through the process by DATCAP, again, just letting us know that these had incorrectly been put in the Farmland Preservation District and that that error needed to be corrected. So um, for the last year, the Town of McMillan has been holding meetings in relation to their comprehensive plan update and they started discussing the rezones in the spring of 2021 and held um, town board and planning commission meetings in September, October and November of 2021 they also held an open house in December uh, to have a public hearing and public hearings and meetings on December 9th to vet this list of rezones. And then we also made our notices through um, our proper notices through the Environmental Resources Committee as well related to these to these rezones. So all the properties listed for rezone are consistent with our comprehensive plan as we take our direction from the town's comprehensive plan regarding specific lands, uses, and zoning districts for individual parcels. And they've again, they've just updated their comp plan in December of 2021, so these rezones would make it consistent with that as well. We also have representatives here from the Town of McMillan Planning Commission who can answer questions related to these lists of properties or the process that was done for the comp plan and the rezones. All right, thank you. Um, and we will have them speak during our, uh, our public hearing portion of that. Um, are there any other staff comments at this time? Otherwise, any questions from committee members on the staff report, both the verbal and the printed one provided in the packet? All right, hearing and seeing none, I will move on to the public discussion. Uh, anyone in favor of the request for the Town of McMillan um, zoning district map changes would please raise your hand if you are in the audience or speak up if you are on the phone. Again, anyone who would like to speak in favor of the uh, Town of McMillan town zoning district map changes, please, uh, this is your opportunity to do so. And once more, anyone looking to speak in favor of the Town of McMillan zoning district map changes? All right, hearing and seeing none, I'll move on to anyone who is opposed to the request for the uh, town zoning district map changes. 
Okay, anyone looking to speak in opposition to the proposed changes to the Town McMillan Zoning District map? And one last call for anyone looking to speak in opposition. All right, and finally, is there anyone looking to speak as interest may appear uh, for the Town of McMillan uh, zoning district map changes? Again, anyone wishing to make general comments as interest may appear on the McMillan zoning district map changes? And one final call for anyone looking to speak as interest may appear on the Town of McMillan uh, recommended changes to the Town Zoning District map. All right, if no one else wishes to testify, I am now declaring the public hearing on the Town of McMillan recommended changes to the Town Zoning District map to be closed. So the committee will now deliberate on the application and apply the standards to make a decision on whether we wish to move these recommended changes forward to the Marathon County Board of Supervisors. Any questions or comments from committee members? Madam Vice Chair, Supervisor Pfeifferick. Supervisor Pfeifferick is recognized. I'd make a motion that we recommend approval of the Town of McMillan recommended changes on their town zoning district map to the County Board. All right, we have a motion to approve. Is there a second? We have a second from Supervisor Overbeck. Uh, any comments or questions from supervisors or committee members? All right, hearing and seeing none, all in favor of the motion to recommend approval of the Town of McMillan changes to their town zoning district map to the full Marathon County Board of Supervisors, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. And with that, we have made it through our three public hearings. So the committee thanks the applicants and the members of the public for their interest and attendance. And we will move on to the rest of the items on our agenda. So. And the next item up is item 4B under review and possible recommendations to county board for its consideration of town zoning changes. Uh, item 4B1, town of Ringle, comprehensive revision and adoption of a town zoning ordinance and zoning districts map consistent with Wisconsin statutes 60.62 parent three. And we have a uh, staff representative who can carry us through the details of this one, Robert? Correct, yeah, I'd like to preface this one with um, just explaining why this one is before um, the Environmental Resources Committee today. Um, and the reason for this um, being presented before you today is because of Wisconsin Statutes um, 60.623A, which states that county board approval must be obtained when situations arise where a town adopts or amends a zoning ordinance in a town that exercises village powers. Um, so that's the reason why this is before you today. And now I will turn it over to Jeff Cuso, um, a county, or excuse me, a community planner and code administrator for Cedar Corporation. I believe Jeff is on the phone. So um, here you go, Jeff. Uh, thank you, Robert. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Cuso, and as Robert explained, I am with Cedar Corporation. We are a uh, engineering and planning consultant uh, based in Wisconsin with multiple locations. Um, so I, there is a memorandum that's shown on the screen and included in your packet, and I'm going to go through that briefly, just explaining the process and what was uh, what was done. Uh, so late in 2020, Town of Ringo hired Cedar Corporation to assist them in developing their a, a new zoning ordinance and a new zoning map to replace their current zoning ordinance and zoning map. Uh, the town of the the town's planning and zoning committee uh, took the lead in developing this ordinance with Cedar Corporation. Uh, just the general reasons that the town undertook this process. Uh, is to, to achieve better consistency with the town's comprehensive plan, 
bring more parcels and uses into conformity with zoning standards, uh, correct, correct inconsistencies, uh, protect its property owners from adjacent incompatible uses, uh, better represent rural growth paths, patterns and preservation goals, uh, stay ahead of the curve in uh, new land use and development trends, and then also, uh, and probably most importantly, is that the uh, ordinance is just outdated since it was adopted in 1975 with uh, little changes since then. Uh, just as far as the process, so again, as I stated, the this process started in late 2020. Uh, we had uh, approximately 15 meetings with the Town Planning and Zoning Committee overall. Uh, that includes one public informational meeting held in May, and then two public hearings, one held in November of last year, and then one held earlier this month. Uh, and then after the public hearing earlier this month, there was a town board meeting on January 10th to adopt the resolution um, to adopt the zoning ordinance and zoning map and request approval from the county. Uh, all meetings were open to the public and properly posted and noticed as per uh, state requirements. Uh, so just going into the zoning ordinance and an overview of what's in there. There are 12 sections total. Uh, so I'll go through those sections one by one. Section one is your just general title authority and general provisions outli outlines where the authority for zoning comes from interpretation and uh, arbogation and greater restrictions. Uh, section two, uh, this section explains the zoning districts, zoning map, uh, principal, accessory, temporary uses, and it also included a table of principal uses, which identifies which uses are allowed in the various zoning districts. Uh, section three is an additional use requirements section. Uh, this requires or outlines special requirements for particular uses, such as uh, accessory dwelling units, non-metallic mining operations, uh, home occupations where there may be special conditions that need to be applied to specific uses. Uh, section four, uh, that's the general requirements section. Uh, it, that's where you'll find the setbacks, maximum height, maximum lot coverage, floor area, accessory structure allowances and restrictions. Uh, and section four also includes a table which uh, outlines what the dimensional uh, requirements are for each zoning district, setbacks, height, et cetera. Uh, section five, that is the parking, loading, and access driveway requirements. Uh, the title says it all, what, what that is all about. It's for off-street parking, loading, access, and the driveway requirements. Uh, section six is a supplemental requirements section. Uh, this included some miscellaneous items that want, that they, the town wanted included in their code. Uh, that includes town road requirements, outdoor storage limitations or requirements, and then also firearms, weapons, and hunting regulations for within the town. Uh, section seven, uh, that is section which outlines requirements for signage. Section eight, mobile tower siting regulations that outlines requirements for cell towers, new cell towers, and uh, modifications to existing cell towers. Section nine deals with non-conforming uses, lots, and structures, and what their restrictions or allowances are there. Section 10 is uh, the administration section. It outlines the duties and powers of the building inspector slash zoning administrator, the town planning and zoning committee, and then also the Board of Appeals. Section 11 is procedures and enforcement. Uh, in, in general, this outlines the procedures and review for, or for review of the various applications and approvals that would be required through the zoning ordinance. And then section 12, uh, that is the definitions section, which just includes various definitions for uh, interpretation and use of the ordinance. Moving on to the zoning map. Um, so we took the current zoning map and took the districts that were there and then created seven brand new districts uh, as far as title wise uh, on the new proposed zoning map. Uh, that includes one agricultural slash forestry district, 
one recreational district, two residential districts, a mixed use district, a commercial district, and a intensive commercial light industrial district. Uh, in general, uh, we took the existing districts and directly translated them to one of the proposed districts. Um, but then there were also uh, the residential districts were expanded outside of the existing areas that were residentially zoned uh, that captured some smaller lots that were already residentially developed and brought them into the residential district. Uh, we also created a concentrated mixed use district in uh, a developed portion of the town uh, where there are existing mixed uses and also very small lots within that area. And, and then there were just some other cleanup per, or cleanup zoning changes uh, where we took existing or previously approved commercial uses and put them in the, the correct zoning district. Uh, so that's a, a very quick and brief explanation of the process and what is being proposed today. Uh, so with that, uh, we respectfully, on behalf of the town, request your support uh, and recommendation for approval of the zoning ordinance and zoning map. All right, thank you very much for that uh, presentation. Um, is there any additional information CPZ staff would like to add before we move into comments and questions? Um, I would just like to note that, um, as a reminder, the town of Ringle is a town zone town. Thank you. All right, committee members, uh, any questions or comments on the proposal? Otherwise, this is listed uh, as an item for possible recommendation to the county board for consideration. Uh, Vice Chair, this is Supervisor Pfeifferk. Supervisor Pfeifferk is recognized. I make a motion of the recommend approval of the comprehensive revisions and adoption of the town zoning ordinance and zoning district map consistent with Wisconsin statute 60.62 parent three for the town of Ringle. Thank you for the motion. Is there a second? We have a second. Supervisor Conway a second. I'll give it to Supervisor Conway. <laughs> You're next to me. So uh, we have the motion in the second. One last call. Any comments or questions from committee members for the motion on the floor? All right, hearing none. All in favor of approving the motion to recommend approval to the Marathon County Board um, for the Town of Ringles uh, zoning district map, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much. And we will move forward into item B2. And a quick question. I note B2, 3, 4, and 5 are all Town of Rib Mountain uh, property ID items. Would it be appropriate for us to look at these uh, together, or do we need to take them individually? Is individual the easiest way to handle this? I believe individually would be okay. the easiest just to go through them quickly verbally. Yep. Just wanted to make certain. Again, I didn't know I was chairing this committee until uh, a little before it started, so I wasn't sure. Um, so then item B2 for the town of Rib Mountain, uh, PIN ending in 0999 ER1 to SR3. And which uh, staff member will be taking this? I will be taking this one, yep. Okay. So um, for the first one, the town of Red Mountain is town zoned and the rezone petition submitted was intended to change the zoning district classification from ER1, a state residential, to SR3, suburban residential. For property located at the southwest corner of the intersection of County Roads N and KK with pin number 068-2807-211-0999, the zone change was approved at the town board meeting on June 1st, 2021. Although the town is town zoned, county board approval is still needed per Wisconsin statutes. Thank you. Um, the second one, uh, the town of Red Mountain is a town zone town and the rezone petition submitted was intended to change the zoning district classification from suburban office to suburban commercial for an approximate 6.8 acre portion of property located south of Oriole Lane with pin number 068-2807-101-0881. 
The zoning change was approved by the town board meeting on June 1st, 2021. Once again, although the town is town zoned, county board approval is still needed per Wisconsin statutes. Okay, any questions on either of those? Okay, and then moving on to the third one, the town of River Mountain is a town zoned um, town and the rezone petition submitted was intended to change the zoning district classification from ER1, a state residential, to SR2, suburban residential, to SR3, suburban residential for property located at 223522 Clover Road and parcel two of certified survey map 41-158. The zone change was approved by the, mayor, the uh, town board uh, meeting on August 3rd of 2021. Although the town is town zoned, county board approval is still needed per Wisconsin statutes. All right, any questions on that item? Seeing none. Okay, and moving on to the final one, the fourth one, the town of River Mountain is town zoned and the petition submitted I was intended to change the zoning classification from SR3 suburban residential to SC suburban commercial for property located at 150518 County Road double N. The zoning change was approved at the town board meeting on January 18th, 2022. Once again, although the town is town zoned, county board approval is still needed per Wisconsin state statutes. Thank you. Okay, so for the four separate uh, town of Rib Mountain uh, zoning changes, uh, one last call for any comments or questions on uh, any of those from the committee. Otherwise, we would be looking for individual motions to approve each of these um, potentially as a recommendation to the county board. Vice Chair, this is Supervisor Pfeifferk. Supervisor Pfeifferk, you are recognized. Um, so do you just want these individually instead I of think in one mass motion, I assume? I'm thinking for record keeping purposes, uh, it would be best to have each item individually uh, motioned. All right, very good. Well, I'd make a motion to recommend approval of the rezoning request in the town of Rib Mountain, PIN number 068-2807-211-0999, ER1 to SR3. Thank you for the motion. Is there a second? We have a second from Supervisor Seafelt. Any comments on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor of the approval for the first item for ER1 to SR3, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, we will move on to item 4B3. Vice Chair Supervisor Pfeifferk. Go ahead, Supervisor. I'd make a recommendation that we rec or I, I would make a recommendation that we re recommend approval <laughs> of the rezoning for the town of Rip Mountain pin number 068-2807-101-0881 SO forward slash SC to SC. Thank you for the motion. Is there a second? Supervisor Drabik seconds. Uh, any comments on the motion? All in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. We will move on to item 4B4. Vice Chair Supervisor Pfeifferk. <laughs> Supervisor Pfeifferk, you're on a roll. Go ahead. <laughs> I'd make a motion to recommend approval of the rezone in the town of Rib Mountain at pin number 068. 2807-221-0951 and PIN number 068-2807-221-095 from, ER1 from ER1 and SR2 to SR3. Thank you for the motion. Is there a second? Second from Supervisor Oberbeck. All right, any comments on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion to approve the uh, Town of Rib Mountain item number three, ER1 and SR2 to SR3, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, we'll move on to the last one, item 4B5. Vice Chair Supervisor Pfeifferk. Supervisor Pfeifferk, go ahead. Make a motion to recommend approval of the rezone in the Town of Rib Mountain 
pin number 068-2807-044-0999, SR3 to SC. Thank you for the motion. Is there a second? Supervisor Overbeck has seconded. And is there any comments on the motion on the floor? All right, then hearing none, all in favor of the motion to recommend approval for item 4B5, uh, SR3 to SC, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. All right, thank you all very much. And we'll move on to item 4C. Review and possible recommendations to County Board for consideration, specifically 4C1, purchase of 39.085 acres adjacent to Brokaw County Park for Parkland. I am assuming that Jamie Polly will be the one to speak to this item, is that correct? Yes, Ms. Vice Chair, that is correct. All right, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. So uh, the county was um, approached by Massey Construction, who owns uh, multiple acres around what we have as Brokaw County Park. It's 70 acres that the county already owns off of Highway W. Um, they are, are looking to sell off some of their land that they know they're not, that they're not going to mine um, in the future. And this parcel came up. Um, it has gone to the Parks Commission when we were looking at it, and they recommended continuing to look and getting an appraisal for it and um, getting it resurveyed to the right amount. So that has been completed. The appraisal came in um, at a little over $93,000, and we took that back to Massey Construction to see if they would be willing to sell it for the appraised price, um, and they are willing to sell it for that. It would add, like I said, 39 acres to our 70 acres we already have, so um, giving us a little over 100-acre county park. It falls in line with the county strategic plan to purchase um, 320 acres per year of park and forest land. Um, and we feel like it complements the 70 acres that we have there very well. It's heavily wooded. It can be used for uh, most likely passive recreational trails uh, that will definitely come back to the Parks Commission for um, approval and design of that facility to see um, exactly what's going to go there when we're ready to develop it. But we're asking today to move this forward to the um, Human Resources and Finance Committee for their approval onto the county board uh, to purchase this uh, 39 acres for the appraised value. Uh, we will be taking it out of our product and lands account, which has about 393,000 in it right now. Uh, that account we have on hand uh, gets funded from timber sales that we have within our county parks, uh, along with some other items. Uh, we will be putting 20 plus thousand back into that account uh, as soon as the timber sale that we just had at Big Old Plain County Park is complete. And then uh, we do have timber sales planned for the next 12 years in the Big Old Plain uh, that will continue to replenish this fund. Great. Thank you very much. Are there any uh, questions from committee members on either the printed or verbal report for this item? Otherwise, I understand from your comments that uh, you're looking for a motion to the HR Property Finance Committee first, um, and then to allow them to move it forward to County Board. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Supervisor Overbeck. Thank you. Um, just one question. It says on the disclosure that there is no environmental um, concerns with this property. Is um, what what do we know what the property was used for, for before offering it for sale? Uh, this is all property that Massey Construction obtained from the uh, paper mill that was there, similar to the 70 acres that we currently have. So um, I believe all of this land was just used for their timber production for the paper mill. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments from committee members? Other, otherwise, I would entertain a motion.
Supervisor Seville? Supervisor Seville? Um, I'll make a motion. Make a motion. I think oh. it was just an echo. Go it's an echo? Okay. <laughs> thought I was saying it twice. Oh. Saying it twice. <laughs> <laughs> to uh, purchase 39.05 acres adjacent to the Brock Barocco County Park. Barocco County Park. And to forward to HR Finance. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. We have a, uh, a double motion, I guess, due to some interesting technology. Uh, is there a second? Pfeifferick seconds. We have a second from Supervisor Pfeifferick. Uh, any final comments on the motion on the floor? All right, hearing none, all in favor of approving the motion to recommend approval of the purchase of the 39.085 acres adjacent to Brokaw County Park uh, onto the HR Property Finance Committee for their consideration, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. All right, thank you. On to item Thank four. you. On to item 4C2. Uh, the Fenwood Creek funding request, uh, which will cover the proposed state funding, the DNR targeted resource management grant, and the county fiscal recovery funds. Um, I believe, Paul, will you be taking this one yes. or at least kicking it off? Yes, this is Paul Dago, county conservationist, and I'll cover those topics. And as you know, this agenda item has been on for quite some time, and it's the number one priority in the land and water plan. And we continue to um, look for funding. And I have some great news to uh, share with the committee. And that is that uh, Senator Bernier, along with Representative Edming, Representative uh, Snyder, and Representative Rosar, have introduced a bill into the state legislature to fund the Fenwood pilot project um, for $607,000 this year, as well as um, similar annual budgeting for the 2023 through 2025 budget. And uh, as you recall, this committee uh, sent a request to executive committee, I believe, um, back in the spring after the land and water plan was passed. And that committee uh, asked administrator, my, uh, Leonard and myself, to work with our legislators. And I've been in contact with them uh, personally, I don't know what uh, Mr. Leonard did as well, but uh, but to advocate for the Fenwood, and actually quite a few of those representatives have showed up for events in the Oplane this summer, and we're pleased that that this bill has been uh, floated around for co-sponsorship, and I believe will be introduced in early February. And uh, obviously no guarantees with what, we all know what happens to bills down in Madison, but we're hopeful. And uh, so I will, I just received that after the packet was together, but I will share a copy of that bill. It's only two pages. And, uh, and we're also, I've been contacted by various groups um, uh, notifying uh, that they would be supporting this bill as well. So we're excited and, um, about that. The other thing is, uh, again, after the passage of the animal waste and nutrient management ordinance, um, we hope to apply for, again, a large-scale watershed project in the Fenwood for a targeted resource management grant. And as I've said in the past, we've applied for them and we had one. And those grants, um, the DNR knows they really need to make modifications to those grants and how they fund projects on farms and uh, the amount of dollars and the staffing that's into them. And we'll, we'll apply for roughly $400,000 for that again. And But I, I just want to be clear with this committee that those projects will help get individual success stories going on farms and help meet performance standards. But if that's the only grant we get for the Fenwood, we will not uh, have a, a cumulative impact in that watershed and, and uh, have measurably improved water quality. 
And I just want to, you know, know that those funds, again, are, you know, we, we again have many farmers we work with that participate in programs, but we, we continue to want to have that cumulative impact. And um, those grants will not get us to that, and the modeling shows that as well. Um, so item C is um, the county uh, fiscal recovery funds. And as you recall, uh, back at the end of August, this committee sent a request to the Human Resource Finance Committee to fund the Fenwood project, similar to the proposal now at the state uh, for funding. And um, based upon recent county board action, um, it appears that um, the department heads, and I, I believe Ms. Uh, Lori, Ms. Kimmons is same page as I, that um, we will have to resubmit that using the new application process approved by the board. And um, I guess unless notified otherwise, uh, this department will start making that application on the ERC's behalf. And uh, assuming you still want to uh, seek those funds unless we hear otherwise. Okay. And I'm open to any questions on any three of those agenda items. Any questions or comments for Paul regarding where we're at with the Fenwood Creek funding project? No. Otherwise, I know in the room I saw some heads nodding when he was making the comments about uh, applying for the, the quote unquote ARPA funds um, and moving forward that, that application again. Uh, is that still the, the general consensus of this committee? Supervisor Overbeck? Yes, I'll make a motion that we continue to apply for the ARPA funds and move this, our request uh, with the formal application to the county board. Okay, so we have a motion to uh, continue to have staff work on that application um, so that it can be brought forward for consideration with the process. I don't know if it goes to county board, right? So. Clarification on, on the motion? Yeah, I'd just clarify that through the committee process and then as it moves forward to the county board. So, okay, so we've got a motion to continue to support staff completing the application uh, following the new process that was approved by the county board last month. Is there a second for that? Pfeifferick seconds the revised motion. <laughs> Supervisor Pfeifferick has the second. Um, any additional comments on that motion? All right, hearing none, all in favor of the motion to uh, empower or to continue to direct staff to apply for the funds following the new process that we approved last month, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. So thank you very much, Paul, for continuing to uh, work so hard to, to get the funding identified for this project. And with that, we'll move on to item 4D, review and possible action on 4D1, the environmental repair fund status. Um, and who, do we, who has the background information for this topic? Uh, this is Dave Hagenbusher, uh, joining from Solid Waste. I can certainly start this conversation. Um, as everybody may or may not know the purpose of this fund, was to provide uh, money and support to municipalities under DNR or EPA orders to clean up their disposal sites. Uh, many funds were dispersed to qualify municipalities over the years. In 2017, Solid Waste Board evaluated municipalities to identify any outstanding closure orders and they did not find any. Uh, because it's established under statute for these specific purposes, uh, the monies can't be used for anything else unless law is changed or deleted. Uh, now, I believe uh, Administrator Leonard is with us today and um, do we have some thoughts on this matter? Yes, I believe Administrator Leonard is prepared as well. Sure. Uh, this is Administrator Leonard, and I think Dave did a great job laying out kind of the history of, you know, how these these funds, and it's, it is about $650,000, have been, uh, collected over time uh, through the solid waste department. And 
there there are currently, as Dave referenced, some limitations on some of those, uh, on the use of those funds that without statutory amendments, um, we would need to comply with. And I know members of the Solid Waste Department have had a number of conversations with local legislators uh, regarding potential amendment of those, uh, of the applicable statute. But, you know, one thing, and Dave, I don't know if you want to, Kind of allude to up, upcoming operational um, closures that are going to happen within our own landfill at the Solid Waste Department, but I'll I'll kick it to you in just a minute because one of the things that those funds can be used, as Dave alluded to, was the closure of eligible landfills. And um, Dave, do you want to talk us through just kind of some of the upcoming um, work being done at the landfill in terms of? Uh, new sites uh, being investigated and closures of existing cells? Uh, yeah, absolutely, Lynn. Thank you. Uh, so the area of E landfill is partially closed right now. Uh, it's about a 30-acre cell, and we have about 10 acres that's currently closed. So we'll need to cap uh, another 20 acres within the next two or three years. Um, that cost is likely going to be 4 to $5 million. Um, another Part of the uh, the Bluebird Ridge landfill, uh, that's our current active site right now that we're taking most of the waste. Um, that site will be expanded in the near future to create more capacity. But as we do that, we need to begin phasing and, and closing a uh, portion of the Bluebird landfill so we don't have so much open landfill footprint. Um, that cost will be uh, probably about $8 million, um, spread out over the course of probably five years. Um, so those are two major closures that we're looking at in the next uh, five to five to 10 years right now. Thanks, Dave. So I, I think that demonstrates a couple of things that um, just to inform this committee, and certainly we'd be happy to hear from you as to what the committee was hoping to get out of this conversation, but some of the investigation that we need to do on the uh, within administration and within the solid waste department is ensuring what are the legal uses of those funds. And if we can essentially take the $650,000 that we have collected uh, pursuant to statute that is legally able to be utilized for closure expenses of landfills located within Marathon County, and we can utilize that to defray costs that we would otherwise incur relative to the closure of our own landfill, um, I think that makes good solid business sense and it's in the best interest of the Marathon County taxpayer, but uh, we certainly need to, to do some investigation just to make sure that those funds are eligible for use in that way. There are some additional um, potential uses that the staff at Solid Waste and working with the Solid Waste Management Board have kind of brainstormed over time, including the um, potential creation of an on-site wastewater treatment facility, um, but Right now, we, we do know, as Dave alluded to, based on the current projections within the uh, solid waste department, we do have those closure expenses uh, that we're going to need to incur. So that's just a kind of a brief history and brief look forward into the future as to what uh, potential uses might exist for those funds. Um, but I'll be honest, I don't know what, if anything, the committee wanted to get out of the the topic and the discussion relative to that environmental repair fund, um, but that's that background that uh, uh, Dave was able to provide. So thank you, Dave, for that uh, information. Thank you, Lance. Thank you. And uh, now, Chair Gibbs, I know that uh, Chair Langenhan let me know that you were going to be here for this conversation. Was there anything specific that you were intending to share with the committee regarding this topic? He's getting the microphone on for those of you waiting. <laughs> it takes a second. Test, test. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, so, uh, Supervisor Langenhan had contacted me. Um, you know, one of the one of the questions was, you know, is there the opportunity for legislative fix? Um, and uh, we, you know, uh, there has been discussions with uh, area legislatures legislator um, and but uh, seeing how it is a narrow um, a very very narrow uh, 
entity, in, in this case probably only one, uh, Marathon County Solid Waste Department, uh, that uh, it fits into this set of circumstances. Uh, you know, a legislative fix, uh, you know, advocated on behalf of WCA uh, or area legislators might be challenging. Um, so I think uh, uh, the way that I would look at it is that the way the administrator has looked at it uh, is doing more research and being able to utilize those funds on potential closures of the current uh, uh, current facilities that we have there would be uh, would be more in line first uh, before we we potentially look at legislative uh, opportunities. Okay, thank you. So then I'm assuming the reason it was posted as a review and possible action was just in case this committee decided they did want to move something forward at this time, um, but it sounds like the recommendations we're hearing from staff and leadership is perhaps not yet. But we do have that option. Chair Hill. Vice Chair, this is Supervisor Feifrick. Supervisor Feifrick. And I, I mean, I think going back, I think um, I had brought this topic up and going all the way back to 2017, um, I guess is where my frustration on this subject begins when the, this, the discussion of the environmental repair fund started when uh, I was on the solid waste management board and discussion of funds and what to do with these funds. We had formed a, uh, I remember if the term is task force or subcommittee of the solid waste management board to oversee this. And we put in significant effort, came up with a program um, similar to how the uh, former environmental impact funds were delegated. And I guess my frustration is that uh, this has been ongoing for years now. Um, I feel like, no, it feels like the, all the time we spent back at that point is uh, all for naught, but I understand if there's uh, limited things that we can do legislatively to move this forward, but it's just frustrating from a process perspective for, for me personally. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. My comment is that you know you're going to have to do something to the landfill on some closures. You're not going to lose any of that money. Right now you have it invested, having some interest in it, getting interest off of that. So I think, you know, that's a good way to keep it because sometimes when you try to get the legislature involved, it makes it worse. You know, because sometimes what they might come up with, you might not like the end result. So I think if you have that money now, and you're not going to lose it. Keep it invested wisely because you got the interest on it. And when you know that you're going to have to close part of the out at the landfill, use that money towards those closures. Thank you. Any other comments from committee members at this time? Otherwise, um, Supervisor Feifrick, I'm just going to ask, since this was a topic for you, are you comfortable with taking no action at this time? Is there anything else you were looking for out of, out of this conversation? Yeah, no action is fine. Thank you. All right. Then with that, I want to thank everyone for the, uh, the update on that topic um, and at least making us aware of where things are at with it. I'm sure this will certainly not be the last time we hear about it, especially with the, the fun on the horizon, it sounds like. So, but for now, we'll move on. So, item five under educational presentations. 5A is for department updates from CPZ and Parks, Rec, and Forestry. Are there any updates that staff is looking to share today that we haven't already covered, I guess I should say? Might, well, this could come as an announcement at the end too, I guess, but, uh, and, and Cindy's gonna hate me, but <laughs> that I did wanna uh, just recognize Cindy Krager because this will be her last meeting with the ERC. Uh, she is retiring from the county this Friday, so we wanna thank her for her five years of service. She's going to be uh, pursuing some of her other passions, travel, gardening, stuff like that, but uh, we're, um, we're lucky to have her and we, we wish her luck in retirement, so. Well, and I'm glad that you brought that up because uh, Chair Long and Han also asked me to make note that she's been with our committee for five years and has done an excellent job. Oh, thank so. you, appreciate it. 
uh, questions on that staff report. <laughs> so, well, we really want to, to thank you, Cindy. Is there anything you'd like to add to that report? It's been my pleasure working with the committee and learning so much about um, the policy making decisions that this committee has made over the years. I think you guys do really great work and I was proud to be part of it. So thank you. Well, thank you very, very much. You definitely were a, a key player in our success that whole time. So I, uh, and am I correct in assuming that we'll be looking forward to seeing the emails come from Nicole in the future? Wonderful. So. Any other items under the, uh, the staff report? All right, uh, then under item six for policy issues, we have none listed this, uh, this agenda. So we'll go right into item seven. Our next meeting will be on March 1st at 3 p.m. here in the assembly room. Uh, committee members, as always, are asked to bring ideas for future discussion to the chair and for inclusion on the agenda. Are there, under item 7B, are there any announcements, requests, or correspondence for the, today? I have uh, two announcements. Uh, number one, I just want to welcome uh, Randy, uh, Rodney Roscoff to our committee in Rodney Farms in the Fenwood. So he has a lot of expertise to bring to this committee when we start talking about these items. And, and he's been a cooperator with our department in the past. Uh, so it, just a, a welcome to him and thanking him for serving this committee. And uh, I also wanted to announce to this committee myself that I'm taking a early retirement uh, this spring and uh, pursue some other opportunities. So uh, I'm working with uh, our new director on a transition plan and a date. Don't have a date hammered out, but it'll be late April, early May probably. So I just want to thank all of you as well. Well, thank you, Paul. I'm sorry to hear we're losing you, but... Uh I'm sure you probably have some fun stuff to look forward to with your brothers and hunting and all of those fun things. So thank you very much for the time. Hopefully this isn't your last meeting with us though. So we got a little bit more time. Good. Any other uh, announcements from the committee members? Marilyn? My concern still is, is that ATC fund, you know where McDevco handles that. And we've had that money there for s several years. And it seems like no one has used that. And my c concern is $400 for an application fee is way too high for, for the, the amount of work that has to be done. It shouldn't take that much staff time to do $400. As I've stated before, in the town of Johnson, we've had the CDBG for Marilyn? Many years. Just be, because this part of the agenda is just for updates and requests, I'm assuming this is a request to revisit this at a The request to revisit this to get more information. And uh, I know some others said, too, you know, we need to rethink where we want to keep that money. Mm -hmm. I'd like to have that on the future agenda item. Okay, we will pass that along. And I know McDevco has a new director, so it would be a great opportunity to get her into the uh, into this committee as well. Yeah, we have a meeting set up with them at the end of the month, so we should be able to bring an update next month. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. So any other items uh, under item 7B for announcements, requests, and correspondence? All right, if there are no others under 7B, I am moving on to item 8. We have a motion to adjourn from Supervisor Seafelt. Is there a second? And second from uh, Supervisor Overbeck. All in favor of adjournment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? We stand adjourned. Thank you all very much for uh, being here today and on this, uh, you know, relatively. This meeting is day. no longer being so. recorded. Also great. Yep. We'll see ya. <laughs>